Okay, I think we should start. It is 11 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, my name is Scott Jacobs. Um, I am the chair of the industry-wide working platform working group. Um, industry-wide being a, a, a P, um, DFI, uh, ADSC and PDCA. Um, um, it came together and started this uh, working group. Um, if you're not a member of the group, please look into it. I encourage you to, to be to be present, be active, contribute. You can go to the DFI webpage and find the working platform working group there. Um, we meet uh, twice twice a year in person and then once uh, virtually in the summertime. We just had a meeting last week at DFI Superpile. The next meeting is scheduled for DFI Annual um, this fall. As a part of that group, um, you know we're doing all things working platform um, lots of uh, lots of things have been accomplished. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of educational things and helping people uh, understand various aspects of working platforms. Um, one one of those items is the, the use of geo geosynthetics in working platforms. Um, Tensar has has been a big help in trying to help us with getting the word out there and um, the, the the use of the of, of geosynthetics. And um, one of the topics um, is is what Andrew will be presenting today. So, um, Dr. Andrew Lees has uh, has published a lot of um, a lot of stuff and a lot of research with working platform design, um, um, and will be presenting on that on that today. Um, and with further ado, Andrew, take it over. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, thank you to you and the working group for the invitation uh, to present to, to you um, this uh, presentation about a uh, design method um, that might be new to some of you. Uh, at Tensar, we've been using it since 2019, so it's already been used in, um, in uh, hundreds of uh, working platforms. Um, so, excuse me, during the hesitations, I'm, while I'm talking, I'm trying to get uh, everything set up. I think we're on the way now. That's uh, slide number two. Okay. So what we're going to cover is um, the, the theory behind the T-value method. So um, a complete introduction from, uh, from square one uh, about the T-value method that we apply for working platforms for both clay and sand subgrade soils. <clears throat> After that, We'll look at some full-scale testing that we have undertaken, and then some additional uh, features of working platform design that I would like to cover, such as uh, considering edge stability, the uh, all-important selection of the phi value for the aggregates from which the platform is constructed, then how to handle very soft subgrades, which is outside the scope of um, existing guidance, and then a couple of case studies to finish with, and as you saw on a previous slide, there will be some Q&A uh, at the end. So uh, if you have any questions as you go along, just enter them into the, um, into the, the box that you have there somewhere. And um, uh, I'll try to answer them at the end. So before we get into that, uh, first of all, why design a working platform? Um, maybe in, in some cases, um, some design um, or detailed design is not even performed. Uh, well, the drawback of that is um, uh, if it's uh, too thick, it may become uh, uneconomical and worse if it's too thin, it's, it's, uh, it would be dangerous. So a working platform is to distribute the concentrated load from uh, a track on a piling rig uh, so that it can um, um, so that it can be supported by the ground beneath. So if the subgrade soil, if the naturally occurring soil at the site is too weak to support the piling rig, you will need a platform to distribute that load. The design method uh, is, is how you determine how thick that platform needs to be. So the, the heavier the load and the weaker the subgrade soil, the thicker this will need to be. So the better the design method, then the more economical it's going to be, you won't be using something too thick. 
but worse still, you won't be getting something too thin. So pining rigs are inherently unstable vehicles. And let's have a look here in this video about how quickly things can go wrong. This is a bearing capacity failure, possibly of a rig going off the edge of a platform, or maybe it's not even a platform at all. So that's something that we clearly want to avoid. Um, they can be uh, very dangerous, those incidents. So that should always be borne in mind with the design method is the, the aspect of safety. So it needs to be an ultimate limit state design with um, a safety margin imposed uh, during the design process. I'm not going to talk too much about safety factors because remember the t-value method is, is a calculation method. It's not a design method that specifies certain uh, margins of safety. So that is more um, uh, given either in design codes, guidance documents, or in um, practice in your engineering organizations. So this is a, a calculation method and the, the reliability that you impose on it, um, that is covered elsewhere. Now, why have we developed a new design method? There were several methods that have been around for several decades. Um, one issue with them is some of them can be overly simplified. So there may just be a load spread, for example, um, a two to one or 26 degree load spread or a 45 degree load spread, something like that. But is that really applicable in all, in all cases? Maybe the load spread needs to vary uh, in different situations. Sometimes it can go the other way. The design methods are too complex. Often they have multiple design charts. That's not really suited to uh, modern design methods and online design software. The more complex methods sometimes have parameters that won't be very familiar to you. So it would be better to have a, a design method that is the right balance, that is complicated enough to handle the different situations uh, but keep the designs economical and safe, but have input parameters that are familiar to you and that which designers uh, understand. Also, the existing methods are either not tested or, or not even suitable for alternative aggregates. So increasingly, uh, we are using recycled or lower quality aggregates because of the, the scarcity of high quality aggregates in some areas. Um, you certainly couldn't use a simple load spread in that situation unless you happen to know what the load spread would be for these alternative aggregates. Again, if we had a design method based on uh, common parameters such as a strength, a phi angle, it would then be easier to measure that and uh, to adopt uh, an alternative aggregate as a platform in your design. And of course, at Tensar, uh, we wanted a design method into which we could introduce the, the benefits of including a geogrid. So a lot of the existing design methods just did not do that uh, very well. So following that introduction, let's learn a bit about uh, what the t-value method is. So first of all, the terminology that we're going to use. Um, so we have a granular layer or aggregate layer. Uh, this particular example has an embedment depth, but of course that doesn't apply for a working platform. So the embedment depth D would be zero, but the t-value method does actually work for uh, embedded foundations as well. So we have an aggregate layer of a thickness H that is supporting a load of width B and that could be a square load or it could be a, a rectangular load or a strip load. So we are looking um, at the short dimension. So this could be a track width and the track length goes into the screen uh, behind. That load is distributed down to the subgrade soil. So we'll start off with a clay subgrade. So the strength is de defined in terms of a CU or SU uh, undrained shear strength. So the most common uh, failure type is a punching shear failure. So shear planes through here, uh, straight or curved, that 
distribute the load down to the subgrade and then a more conventional bearing capacity mechanism in the subgrade. Something else that will become important later on in the method is this self-weight vertical effective stress, P prime zero. It's just the, um, it's the self-weight of this material, of the platform, uh, minus any pore pressure. Now you wouldn't normally have a platform that is submerged. Uh, that's certainly not something that you want to happen, but if you wanted to consider it as a design case, a temporary or accidental design case, then the method can handle um, water even within the platform. And that is taken into account with this effective stress term here. Now, to develop this method, we looked back at um, various physical tests that have been undertaken. Now, undertaking full-scale tests is not easy, and we'll see that later on. So a good compromise is to do model tests, so that's scaled model tests. If you do them in the laboratory on the bench top, they don't work very well. That's called a 1G model test. If you scale everything down, the stress is all scaled down, so it just doesn't work very well. That's why you put it in a centrifuge to get those self-weight stresses back up, and then the soil will have the same uh, stresses within it. Now, uh, because soil is a frictional material, it's important to have the right stress level within the soil. So a centrifuge test is the best way to do a scaled model test in, in geotechnical work. So we found this work um, performed in Japan, quite extensive work, 60 tests with circular and strip footings on a, a granular layer composed of sand overlying a clay subgrade. And they varied the thickness of the granular layer, the width of the loading, and the strength of the subgrade. Now, when we looked at the bearing capacities that were obtained from these model tests and expressed them as this ratio here, which is the bearing capacity, QU, divided by the bearing capacity at the subgrade surface. So in a clay, that would be simply 2 plus pi times the SU value or 5.14 SU. If we plot that bearing capacity as a ratio against this geometric ratio, the thickness of the platform divided by the loaded width B, we found that the results plot as a straight line. So there's a linear relationship between this ratio and this ratio here. The good thing about this diagram is it's dimensionless. So it should be applicable across a wide range of cases, and it doesn't depend on the particular uh, conditions in the test. So those were the strip footings. Now, they performed many more circular footing tests. So we've plotted the data in the same way, but this time we have different subgrade strengths. Uh, these are in uh, kilopascals. So I'm sorry about that for the, for the US audience. There'll be a few metric units here. Um, but 10 is really soft and uh, 51 is a, is a sort of, it's about a firm, firm to stiff clay, something like that, just to give you an idea. But because they are circular footings, we plotted this time the square root of the ratio because we can have load spread in two directions. If we do that, if we plot them as a square root, we then still get a linear relationship. So if you take each strength of the subgrade you see that they lie on a straight line. So that's the 51, that's the firm clay. If we look at the very soft clay, they also plot on the straight line up this way. But you notice that the slope changes. So it's not a constant relationship. Uh, and by the way, OB means overburden. So one test was undertaken with a, a depth D, but we found that that's still, um, provided a linear relationship. So what you see here is uh, when H is zero, this ratio is one, as you would expect, because when this is zero, you have no platform at all, and this footing sits directly on the subgrade. So that's why the ratio is one. But as the thickness H of the platform increases, you see you get a gradual increase in this uh, bearing capacity ratio. So this slope here defines how much that bearing capacity ratio increases as the platform 
becomes thicker. So that slope is very important. So we called that slope T. And this is where the name of the design method comes from, the T value method, because we are defining the performance of a platform on a subgrade in terms of this T value. Once you know what this is, you can design any platform with these simple equations. So these are just the equations of those straight lines. The bearing capacity ratio for the strip footing is equal to one because all these lines start at one plus the slope T times this ratio H over B. If it's a square or circular footing, then we just square the term in the brackets. So when we do a design, we calculate the bearing capacity of an infinitely long strip, and we calculate the bearing capacity of a square um, footing of the same width B. And then when we have a rectangular uh, loaded area, such as under the track of a piling rig, you interpolate between the two. And that's one of the important strengths of the t-value method is that we calculate the bearing capacity at both extremes of the shape ratio. So B over L equals um, zero for the strip and B over L equals one for the square or circular footing. And for rectangular footings, we interpolate between the two. Now, this is the only design method or the only calculation method rather that does uh, both of those calculations. Most of the existing ones uh, calculate the strip footing and then apply a shape factor which extrapolates the bearing capacity towards a square shape. But this one calculates it at both ends and then interpolates. So it should be more accurate um, in that respect. Now, we also need this inequality here to check for a surface failure entirely within the platform. So when H becomes sufficiently big relative to B, and also when the subgrade becomes sufficiently strong, the most critical failure becomes a shallow failure entirely within the platform. So that's why in every design, there should be a check on the surface failure just to um, confirm which is the most critical. Once that happens, then um, the thickness of the platform doesn't make any difference. doesn't matter if you increase it, you're not going to increase the bearing capacity anymore because it all happens uh, uh, within the platform. Now, let's, sorry, I went ahead a bit soon. Um, you notice how the T value changes. So you get a steeper slope with a weaker subgrade soil. That might seem counterintuitive at first. So the weaker the subgrade, the higher the T value. Well, that's true, and I'll explain why. But remember, this is a bearing capacity ratio. It does not mean you get higher overall bearing capacity as the subgrade gets weaker. No, it just means that the ratio uh, is increasing. So let's see uh, why that happens. So why does T decrease as the subgrade gets stronger? So let's look at this case of uh, a load on a platform on a very weak subgrade. So when you reach bearing capacity failure here, this happens at a relatively low load because the subgrade is so weak. So the stress level, the shear stresses in the granular layer are relatively low because this failed very easily. So because the shear stress is relatively low in the granular layer, we're not working it very hard. We haven't mobilized very much of its strength. So it distributes the load with ease. If we contrast that with a strong subgrade, to cause bearing capacity failure now requires a higher stress. That means higher shear stresses in the granular layer or platform. And what we see is that the load spread narrows. As the shear stresses reach uh, the yield point, the granular soil cannot um, support those shear stresses anymore. Then the 
the angle of that load spread has to narrow. So we see a less efficient uh, load distribution. So the, the, the aggregate or the granular layer of the platform is now working much harder, which is why you get a lower T value when you have a strong subgrade. Now, how do you determine the T value and what does it depend on? Well, we saw from the graphs earlier that it seems to depend on the subgrade strength, but of course it also depends on the platform strength. So the centrifuge tests that you saw earlier, they've been plotted on this diagram. We have also plotted um, studies, numerical studies that are already published. So not by us, uh, the FEA is finite element analysis study by Bird and Friedman at the University of Oxford. And the FELA is finite element limit analysis. And that was a study by Professor Scott Sloan and his colleagues at the University of Newcastle in Australia. Uh, quite well known papers in this field. So we back calculated from the bearing capacity, capacity the T values for all these cases. Now the numbers in the legend indicate the friction angle in degrees. So if we take the two values of 40 degrees from entirely independent numerical studies, you see how the green and orange dots uh, are more or less coincident and they follow this line here for the 40 degree case. We've also plotted lines for 45 degrees, 35 degrees and 30 degrees. And we see that we get this consistent relationship when we plot them against the undrained shear strength of the subgrade normalized by that effective overburden pressure that we saw at the start. If we just plotted it against the undrained shear strength, we would not get such a good relationship. So this normalization improves the relationship, but also makes the whole chart dimensionless. It's always advantageous if these charts and these relationships can be dimensionless. That means that they are generally more applicable across a wide range of cases. So what I like about this chart in particular is the way that you can see how platforms perform all on one chart. So here you have the strength of your platform material and here you have the strength of the subgrade. So you can see how as the subgrade gets very weak, you get a rapid increase in this uh, in the t value it's because as i explained before the shear stresses become very low in the platform relative to its strength therefore it becomes very good at distributing the load so these were all studies in plane strain or for infinitely long strip foundations we also looked at studies again numerical studies as well as the centrifuge tests on circular foundations just to give us an idea of how uh, square uh, shaped loads will perform. We found if we put, if we plotted the same four lines that are over here, they formed a lower bound to these values here. So this is the 45 degree line and it's forming a lower bound to these green dots. There seems to be more variability in the um, circular or axisymmetric analyses. So that's why we chose to have a lower bound. It also simplifies the method because we have the same lines here for uh, circular or square foundations and for strip foundations here. So actually you only need one chart for both cases. If you want to read more about the derivation of the method on clay subgrades, it was published uh, back in 2019 in this peer-reviewed journal paper here. The, the, um, the proceedings of the Institution of Civil Engineers in the UK, uh, Geotechnical Engineering. Now, later on, we derived the same method for the case of a sand subgrade soil. So here, of course, the strength is defined in terms of a friction angle, phi, just like the platform material. 
So the platform material now has a phi of phi one and a unit weight or effective unit weight of gamma one and the subgrade phi two and gamma prime two. So both of these sets of parameters become important, both the phi and the, the self weight um, or unit weight. The good thing is that those equations that you saw before, they stay the same. So we have the same design method, whether it's a sand subgrade or a clay subgrade. The difference is that the relationship between the T value and the subgrade strength is now different, of course, because it's defined in terms of phi instead of um, SU. But that's another good advantage of this design method is it stays the same, more or less the same across different subgrade types. Now, there wasn't so much published work for um, an aggregate layer over a sand subgrade. So we, we did it much of our own um, par um, numerical parametric studies. I did the finite element analysis and uh, my co-author Abid Ali at Geofabrics in Australia did the finite element limit analysis. So we did a parametric study varying all the parameters that you see there for both plane strain. So that's an infinitely long strip and an axisymmetric or approximately square loading like before. And we derived these relationships here. <clears throat> Similar to the, the one for the clay subgrade, we've got T on the vertical axis and this time the subgrade strength in terms of phi two on the horizontal axis. This time we needed separate uh, graphs for strip and square foundations. So the T value can be defined by this um, elegantly simple equation here. It depends on the ratio of the strengths between the platform and the subgrade and the ratio of the unit weights. And we just have this shape factor that we need, which is one for the strip foundation and less than one for the square foundation. But as before, we calculate the bearing capacities for both. And then for a rectangular footing, we interpolate between the two results. So you can see how, again, all on one chart, um, how the performance of the platform depends on the ratio of the strength. So when phi one is 35 and phi two is 35 here, we have a T value of zero. A T value of zero means you have absolutely no benefit of constructing a platform with a phi of 35 degrees on a subgrade of phi of 35 degrees. And that makes perfect sense. But as the difference between the platform strength and the subgrade strength increases, so the T value increases either up this way as the subgrade strength reduces or up this way as the platform strength increases. So a quick look at the, the parametric studies that we undertook uh, with finite element analysis and finite element limit analysis. That's the FEA, that's the FELA. So the closer those points are to this line, uh, the more accurate the equation is. So it's remarkably accurate given the simplicity of the equation. And there's some physical test data, not much, uh, mostly fairly small scale, which is why it's down here. Again, a good match between the physical test results and um, what is predicted by this new method. Just one up here at a larger scale. Um, there will, we are doing our own um, full scale testing on a platform on sand subgrade. So look out for those results, they'll be available uh, very soon. If you want to read more about the derivation of that uh, t-value method on sand subgrade, that is um, published in the same journal, the same peer-reviewed journal from the ICE uh, that was published uh, early last year. So that was the, the theory of the t-value method and how it works. Um, now, of course, if you're going to determine a new design method, you need to um, validate it. And you need to do that in full-scale testing, really. 
unless you happen to have a centrifuge um, that you can use. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about full-scale testing and uh, the requirements for full-scale testing. Now, to derive a new design method, you definitely need to do the validation testing, and it needs to be a full scale. And I, I'll explain why in a moment. When you are constructing a platform and it's going into service, uh, the testing that you need to do is really up to uh, the design engineer. Um, you could decide to do full scale testing to failure, but that's that's very expensive. It all depends on the level of uncertainty. Um, are you using a new platform material, for example, or is it um, an unusual soil? Uh, that probably won't be necessary in more routine platforms, but you might need to do some testing to check that the platform has been constructed adequately. That may be smaller scale, but do bear in mind that when it becomes smaller scale, you're not really validating the whole design. You are just verifying that the platform has been constructed um, adequately. So let's just explain that a bit more. So imagine uh, we have uh, a, a track from a piling rig here. So it has a, a certain width that we know about when we do the design. Now, when you do, um, if you are going to validate a, an ultimate limit state design, you have to test to ultimate load. You don't just test the working load because that doesn't tell you if you've got the safety margin. So when you do an ultimate limit state design, you calculate what the ultimate or failure load is, and then you apply a safety factor to that. So your working load is, um, is less so that you have the safety margin than the ultimate load. If you then do a test, a plate load test, only to the working load, then all you have verified is that you will get a certain settlement and it won't fail at the working load, but you don't know what the safety margin is. So if you want to ensure that you have the safety margin, then you must test uh, to the full ultimate load. When we verify our new design method, of course, we have to take it up to the ultimate load. And it's also very important uh, to validate the whole design that you have uh, a plate diameter in your plate load test that approximately equals the track width. The reason for that is, imagine with this track on the left, uh, what the influence zone is. So I've drawn that at 1.5 times the width of the track. You see how deep it goes. It could be deeper, certainly for settlement, but maybe for bearing capacity, 1.5 is enough. Then imagine that we did a plate load test, uh, but we just um, didn't have the equipment or the money to do a plate load test as big as this. So we took a more standard 12 inch diameter plate. So the plate diameter is much less than the track width. So our influence zone looks something like that. Now, does that represent the condition over here? Uh, no, it doesn't. In fact, with this plate, you will get much better performance because really you're testing only this strong granular material, this, this aggregate of the working platform. So you'll get very high strength and less settlement than you would over here because this is causing stress changes in the subgrade below. So you'll get more settlement and a weaker response here. So that should always be um, borne in mind. So this test what it could achieve is to verify that the platform has been constructed adequately. So this might give you the stiffness of the platform material, but it's not going to uh, confirm the bearing capacity of this track when it comes onto the platform. So it's important to, to remember that. So if you did want to check the bearing capacity, you need to do a test with a bigger plate that matches the track width. I'm not saying that needs to be done on every platform, but if you think that you do need to check it, then that's how it's done. But uh, it's not easy. But we have done it as part of our research into working platforms. 
So with the help of the University of Saskatchewan, um, they have over several years done full-scale tests on um, platforms constructed in trenches such as this. Uh, so they excavate trenches to expose the silty clay beneath a, a softer, firm, silty clay. And they do a series of uh, one meter square or um, just over uh, three foot square plates, one after another, into platforms constructed on the subgrade below. And you see the reaction load that you need in order to take such a big plate to ultimate load. Uh, they needed these trucks to provide the reaction force. So there's a close-up view of the, the one meter square plate in the platform with all these targets for photogrammetry so that we could see um, all the displacements across the whole area. And we've tested a range of aggregates um, from high quality crushed rock to lower quality material such as this. Um, I like this video. This is a speeded up video of what the test looks like. I hope that's coming through okay. It's, it's showing you at 100 times speed what a full scale test to failure looks like. We see we're getting the full failure plateau in the graph there. So that's being, um, that's being taken up to about 40 tons there. And you can see this reaction frame being pushed up by the load there. So it's not easy to do, but when it is done right, it's very impressive and very informative when we uh, verify our design methods. Uh, here I've got a, a video of, of more full-scale testing that we undertook in Poland. Um, this shows you an alternative method of performing a test that uh, is more, uh, more practical on working uh, construction sites. So the previous one was a university project. This one was a, an active site, and thanks to uh, Menard in Poland for allowing us or, or for performing the tests for us actually on this corner of the, the site in Krakow. Um, at my end, the video is coming through a bit jumpy, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it's coming through okay at your end. But it was a, a platform built on a, on a softer, firm clay out of a, a well-graded, high-quality crushed rock. So you can see it uh, being compacted there. It's, um, uh, it's, oh, and there's the, um, the site investigation. So when you test on a clay, it's very important to get the shear strength on the day of testing because the undrained shear strength varies due to changes in moisture. And when you construct the platform, straight away, the moisture condition changes. It might have been exposed to the surface. Now it's been covered, so it might get uh, wetter. So we undertook shear veins and um, um, marchetti dilatometers. But this now this is earlier on. Uh, these are CMC uh, ground improvement columns being installed. So these were being installed as anchor piles. So this is an alternative method to perform a large scale test to failure. So this was a one meter diameter plate, but it was loaded the same way as in a pile load test with four anchor piles. There's the plate in the middle and the reaction frame is being uh, set up there. Uh, yes, here comes the reaction frame and they're setting up the instruments there to measure the settlement uh, of the plate. So they're yeah, very familiar to, to all of you, I'm sure, uh, a, a pile load test, but this time with a plate instead of uh, a pile in the middle. And those anchor piles are placed far enough away not to influence the, the result of the plate. So that was uh, loaded. Um, you might be able to see it moving there as it's loaded. Um, now we had serious trouble failing the platform. It wasn't very thick, but uh, because we had some tensile geogrid in there, uh, we, we went and got some extra 
weights, those concrete slabs. And we got the excavator to help provide some reaction. And um, we had real trouble failing the platform. Uh, you'll see the data shortly. But that's a, that's a nice video, just showing uh, an alternative test method that worked very well. And we've used it on other sites as well. Um, so you know how much a pile load test costs, um, something that's done fairly routinely on a lot of sites. So that provides a, a good means to, to undertake uh, the sorts of large scale to ultimate load plate load test that you need if you if you really want to verify the ultimate limit state design. So here's a bit of data from the subgrade. Um, very consistent conditions. It's a perfect site for doing uh, research work. So look at those uh, shear vein results consistently 60 kilopascals or uh, just over 1200 uh, pounds per square foot. And the DMTs uh, were giving uh, something a little bit lower, but uh, of, of the same order. So when we uh, back calculated the, uh, the T value, um, we calculated what we thought the bearing capacity would be. And then we compared that with the actual load deflection plot from the plate. Now, all these unload reload loops um, occurred because the contractors doing the pile load tests were not used to pile settlements. They kept going the full travel of the hydraulic cylinder and of the displacement transducers. So it kept having to be uh, reset, but the, the primary loading curve is what you see here. And you see how we had trouble trying to reach a plateau. It never reached a plateau. So what we did is we used the definition in the British standard of um, a failure, which uh, you can use if you don't reach a plateau, which is 15% of the plate width. So that gives us this failure load here, 770 kilonewtons for the plate. Now, according to the T value prediction for that particular platform with GeoGrid in this case, this is what we were predicting. So we're very pleased with that result, a comfortable margin of, of safety there. So that's very good verification uh, of the design method. And that's the sort of testing that needs to be done when you have a a new design method. If you want to read more about that, uh, we published that um, about the testing and the derivation of the T-value relationship there for that particular aggregate of that geogrid on a clay subgrade. So that's full-scale testing. Um, while I'm talking about testing, uh, just um, a re quick review of some existing guidance documents as well as BR470, which is well known uh, from the, the building research establishment in the UK. More recently, the Temporary Works Forum in the UK produced this guidance on working platforms, in which a number of design methods are mentioned and the T-value method um, is mentioned in the back of there. And also the DFI and EFFC, um, they produced a guide to working platforms recently. And currently the the second uh, edition is, is being uh, worked on uh, as we speak. So that version one um, made mention of the T-value method. And I understand that it's uh, being included as um, in the a list of design methods uh, in the revised guidance. Now, uh, something else that we've added to the design method is edge stability because um, a lot of uh, accidents with piling rigs um, or bearing capacity uh, incidents occur off the edge of platforms or near the edge of platforms. And I think that video I showed earlier was it seemed to be going off the edge of something and, and, um, and then suffering a, a bearing capacity failure at the front of the tracks. So we did a study of this uh, using FEA again, this time 3D FEA, because we looked at the effect of different shape ratios as well. So this is an infinitely long strip at the edge of a platform. So we, we varied the edge distance from zero, which is right at the edge, and distances are one, two, three, and infinite edge distance with um, this edge slope here. Actually, the, the slope angle here does not make much difference to the results. 
So um, we did not need to vary that. We looked at different thicknesses of platform and different strengths of subgrade. And just uh, push these, um, these strips down to failure. Now, here's an example of a different B over L ratio. So this is the advantage of doing it in 3D, is that we can see the effect of uh, rectangular loadings as well. That's what an infinite edge distance looks like. So it's just with uh, no platform edge at all. And here's a look at the results. These results were obtained by uh, a strength reduction technique. So instead of pushing them all the way to failure, which is quite difficult to do in finite element analysis, we apply a working load and then you reduce the strength of the soil in a stepwise fashion so that you obtain a factor of safety on soil strength. So if we plot um, the plane strain edge distance for different safety factors, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, we can get a reasonable prediction of that using equation one. You see how they all sit on this black line where they are equal, where the FEA output equals the prediction. And that's equation one, very simple. It's the width of the loading plus the, this value A, which is just to control the safety factor, times the thickness of the platform H times the T value. So we'll look at that on the next slide. You'll notice that as the edge distance becomes very small, then the equation tends to over predict um, the required edge distance. But we didn't mind that because you have a nominal minimum edge distance in any case, and that won't be less than a meter. So um, we thought this equation um, would work. And this is what it looks like in section to explain um, the meaning of the terms it's effectively saying what this distance needs to be because you need, because when you, when the, um, when the failure mechanism in the subgrade extends beyond the end of the platform, the edge here, you get a loss of surcharge here. So that's why you start to get a loss of the bearing capacity. So you need to predict what this distance is here. And that depends, of course, on the width of the loading here. It depends on the thickness of the platform because of this load spreading effect. And that load spreading effect depends on the T value. The higher the T value, the more load spread you get. So that's why you get this relatively simple equation here. So that allows you to ensure that when you've done a platform design, that you can also determine what the minimum edge distance is. So you should not let your rig get uh, closer than this to the edge. And sometimes the edge distance is quite large, uh, larger than you may think uh, when you have um, a particularly weak subgrade or particularly thick platform, for example. Now, you remember, we also looked at the effect of the B over L ratio. So let me go back to that previous slide. This is for infinitely long strips. So this is a track that's running parallel to the edge of the platform. But of course, tracks aren't infinitely long, they are shorter. And sometimes the rig may even be pointing around the other way. So with different uh, B over L ratios, what was the effect of that? We could also get that from the output of the FEA. So for all the different cases that we looked at with different subgrade strengths and platform thicknesses, we got this approximately linear relationship with B over L. So we got this correction here for the shape factor. So um, if um, as your uh, loaded area goes towards uh, a square shape, the edge distance can become smaller and that makes sense. Um, so that is also a useful feature of this edge distance check. And by the way, if you're going to the the DFI 49th annual conference in Colorado in October. Uh, we have a paper that's been accepted for publication there uh, about this new edge stability uh, part of the design method. So look out for that. And that will be presented by Dr. Mark Wayne from Tensar. Now, a little bit on the selection of the phi value. 
for the platform material. This is becoming more important as we use alternative aggregates. So we need to test them and to get to know what the strength properties are of these platform materials. Now, we have a lot of uh, experience in testing aggregates in our own laboratories at Tensa. We have these very large triaxial rigs. So uh, I'm hiding behind there just to give you an impression of the scale. Uh, so they're half a meter diameter or about 20 inches in diameter and one meter high or 40 inches. They're that big so that we can test large aggregates. Um, so even with a, an aggregate of, um, uh, let's say, about uh, five inches size, you really want to be to have a diameter at least six times that. So you're, you're very quickly getting up to um, 20 inches, that sort of range. It also allows us to test um, aggregates with our geogrids uh, within there as well. So that's another reason that we need a reasonably large uh, specimen size. So we've, um, we've got uh, one rig in, uh, at our facility in Morrow in, uh, um, near Atlanta, and we've got one in the UK. Uh, the one on the right, that's actually a video. You can speed it up. It's just showing you what, um, what the test looks like. Um, so the aggregate is in here, and we apply a vacuum pressure to apply the confining stress, and we can calculate the strength um, from these tests. Now, there's, um, there's been quite a lot of discussion and debate about um, uh, what phi value to take for platform materials. Um, so I'm just going to use this opportunity to give my opinion. Um, there's a growing trend to use peak values uh, for platform materials. Um, I've got a, a number of concerns there. Number one is, uh, first of all, there is no unique phi value for a platform material. Um, for, for a start, you have a peak value. And then as you see in this curve here, when you reach peak strength, it then reduces. So you have a strength that varies with the strain level. The strength also varies with the stress level. So it might be quite high at low confining stresses and get low at higher confining stresses. And you even get different friction angles when you use different test methods. So if you use a direct shear or shear box, you will get a higher friction angle due to the confining effects of the rigid box than you will in a triaxial cell, which is more appropriate for the platform. Well, that's, that's hard to say, but there is no unique value and you need to be particularly careful about the strain level. So here we see a typical triaxial test on an aggregate and you reach this uh, failure strain. So I've normalized this so it's the, the applied stress divided by the stress at failure. So when it reaches one, that's peak failure in this case. And that happens at that strain level. If you tested a subgrade material, so relatively a much softer material than the aggregate, that's going to reach failure at a higher strain level. It varies between soils, but maybe way over here. So this failure mechanism that you're trying to predict is a combined failure mechanism. It's shear failure in the aggregate as well as shear failure in the subgrade. So to fully mobilize that failure mechanism, you need to uh, fully mobilize the strength in both. So if you have to fully mobilize the strength of the subgrade, the strain level is right over here. But the aggregate failed at a strain back here. So the aggregate could go well, well beyond this peak failure strain and to go beyond and the, the, the strength reduce. So that must be borne in mind in the, in, when you select a phi value for design. You should never just take the pink value uh, by default. You do need to consider the strain levels within um, this mechanism that you are assuming is, uh, is occurring. And the strength value needs to be appropriate for the full mobilization of that mechanism. And these aren't new, these thoughts. Hannah and Mayerhoff, that's uh, a well-known uh, calculation method for this particular problem. Um, this is a chart-based method. Um, so it's used less often now, um, but it's uh, still a well-known paper right back in 1980. If we read carefully through here, based on the fact that the failure strain of the upper sand layer, they mean the, this layer here, 
is less than that of the lower soft clay layer, simultaneous occurrence of the shearing failure in both layers could not take place, and more strain is required in the upper layer to reach the lower layer failure strain value. So it means that to reach this failure point, we, the strain level in the aggregate goes beyond the peak and comes down here. Thus, the mobilized angle of shearing resistance of the sand layer could be less than the peak and could approach the residual value. So, so do bear that in mind when you select uh, the phi value. Um, the strain level is very important. Now, one uh, more feature that uh, we added back when we started uh, with the t-value method is what to do when you have very weak subgrades. A lot of the existing guidance stops when the undrained shear strength SU of the subgrade is less than 20 kilopascals or 418 uh, PSF. So if you are designing a platform on a subgrade with a strength less than that, what are you going to do? So to help with that, we came up with um, a correction that we apply to the T value. Um, when uh, the, the subgrade strength gets below a certain level. So if we go back to this chart that I showed you in the derivation of the t-value method, you see how when the subgrade strength gets very low at this end, you see how these lines go uh, very climb very steeply. So it's one of the, the many reasons why you need to be cautious when the subgrade strength gets very low, because now, small changes in strength give you a very big change in T-value and therefore a very big change in the bearing capacity. It also becomes very difficult to construct a platform on such a soft subgrade. So are you going to achieve the same levels of compaction? So that should be borne in mind in the selection of the phi value again. And the assumed failure mechanisms of the existing design or calculation methods may assume punching shear, but when the subgrade gets very soft, are you getting a, a punching shear? Well, one advantage of the t-value method is that because it is derived from finite element analysis and finite element limit analysis, there are no predetermined failure modes. So uh, these numerical analyses determine the most critical failure mode. So you don't input a punching shear mode the numerical analysis determines the most critical mode. So because the t-value method is derived from that, it should cover all the failure modes that are predicted by the numerical analysis. So we don't have that issue where we are restricted to a punching shear mode. So what you also see from this chart is how the t-value uh, has a strong relationship with SU normalized by the overburden stress. So it makes more sense to put um, some sort of correction based on this value rather than just a undrained shear strength. So we selected a value of 1.25, which corresponds approximately with this value for typical platform thicknesses. So when it goes below 1.25, we apply this correction to the T value. So it decreases the T value as you move further and further away from this uh, boundary here. So what that looks like are, is these red dashed lines. So once we have a design that goes below this point here, we apply this correction. Now, of course, this isn't just applied blindly, this correction. Um, you do need um, experience and competency to perform designs in such difficult conditions, but it provides a starting point um, for, for the design and reminds the designer that um, this correction is needed and to uh, consider uh, broader issues on the site about whether you want to make a, a further correction to this. But we've been doing that since 2019 when we introduced this, this design method. So we've been using it a lot and uh, so far it, uh, it, it has produced reliable designs. So, this is also in the, the paper that's going to be published at the conference in October as a, a proposal um, uh, and to just show the industry a, an approach that we have been taking uh, for five years now.
Okay, so it's coming up on a full hour, so I'm just going to skip through uh, a couple of case studies. Uh, we've been using this method over in Europe, particularly in the UK, as I said, for four years. So we've got a couple of examples in the UK. Um, these show the benefit not only of including a tensile geogrid within the platform, but also the new design method. In particular, if you compare the design method that we have, T-value with GeoGrid compared to conventional methods um, with GeoGrid. So this was a, a, a poor ground. So installing a tensor MSL, as we call it, mechanically stabilized layouts and aggregate with GeoGrid. And that's the rig it supported. So 14% reduction in cost, 20% saving in time um, on that particular platform there. And another one, uh, for a, a new um, cloud computing headquarters. Uh, thanks to the, the savings in aggregate, both from the GeoGrid and also the T-value method, uh, almost reduced by a half the construction costs of the platform, over a half the construction time, and a 50% reduction in embedded carbon as well. So I'm gonna summarize now. So the T-value method, uh, I think the best part about it is its simplicity. It's a simple linear dimensionless relationship, but seems to be very accurate across a wide range of cases. So more accurate and scientifically rigorous than some of the existing uh, methods. How do you obtain the t-values? Well, we've already derived them for the phi value of the platform, that all important phi value. Um, for non-stabilized, that's layers without geogrid. We've also derived them with geogrid stabilization for a range of aggregates. We have them for recycled aggregates now. So we test them in the large triaxial, then we do the full scale testing uh, so that they can be used with reasonable confidence um, in the design of real working platforms on which piling rigs are going to work. As I said, uh, validated by that important full-scale testing to failure. And recently we've added an edge distance check, um, a correction for very soft subgrades that goes back uh, to when we introduced the t-value method, and I just made some points about the important selection of the, the phi value. If you want to read about the derivation of the method, it appears in these peer-reviewed journal publications that you saw. And if you want to use the method, you have the option of preparing your own spreadsheets because the, the method is set out in those papers that I described. And I know a number of design offices and consultants who have done that. Uh, but we also have our own online software. So you can use the T-value method. You can try it out today. And the advantage of doing that is you can do a design without GeoGrid to see how thick that platform will be. And you can try it out uh, with our GeoGrid as well, the benefit from the cost, time, and environmental savings with the GeoGrid. So that's all on our uh, online uh, design platform. So there are design uh, apps for a number of different applications there, and Working Platforms is one of them. If you haven't had a look yet, then um, do go to tensarplus.com or use the QR code and just uh, try it out for yourself. And uh, Scott, that brings me to the end. So thank you very much, everybody, uh, for listening. And I'd be happy to take any questions. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I just wanted to say real quick, if, if you cannot wait for the uh, DFI conference in October, the paper actually was also published and is already available in ADSC's Foundation Drilling Magazine. Um, it, it is available as, as, as I speak. Um, so if, you're, if you can't wait, go there and you can see the paper. Um, but definitely it will also be published at DFI in October. So two, two ways to see that paper.
Um, I have a couple questions. Um, I actually have a few myself. Um, and one is just like, Andrew, if you can clarify the, the, the factors, of, the factor of safety uh, on the T method itself. I know like the BRE method has like load factors for various situations. I know when you did the load test, you had a um, pretty reasonable margin there with uh, uh, measured versus predicted. Um, but in terms of like, if I'm using the T method, like I am the BRE method to calculate uh, what sort of platform thickness do I need for a track pressure and I have an answer of whatever it is, a meter. Um, what sort of like, like what sort of, what's 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 the next step? What because like BRE method in that calculation, there is a load factor that that I know that serves as some sort of a factor of safety, so that my platform thickness is not, you know, right on the right on the margin. There is some extra margin there. So how do I account for that in the method in the T method? Well, what we do in our own design software is we uh, we we take two approaches. Actually, we take the BR four seventy approach, so that can be used. Um, it may not be available in the US. I just want to put in that caveat before anyone uh, goes to to look for it. Um, it. It may not be available, but that uses that BR four seventy approach, which has two load cases, two load cases that are quite well defined for. Um, the, the different modes of operation of the rig. So one has a lower factor of safety because the operator has more control of the rig at that moment. Um, so it, it's, it's less risky. And the other one where the rig operator has less control has a higher load factor imposed on that. So we, we, we take that approach. So that's one of the approaches we use. If it's not BR470, then it's just a, a lumped factor of safety. And um, I think the designer is free to choose in, in that module. Uh, so typically about 1.5 um, factor of safety would be used, um, but that it, it's hard for me to give a hard and fast value that's yeah. going to work across all cases. It, it's, it's, it's either down to the designer or down to whatever the the regulatory requirements are uh, where you're operating. I see. So you then you so the designer needs to take the the, the, the load essentially and and apply whatever factor of safety they feel comfortable with, um, and then use the method as mm -hmm. as okay. Thank you. Um, the next one and and you did kind of you did kind of clarify this. I just wanted to drive home the fact that this method can be used with or without geogrid, right? Yeah. And then the without geogrid, how did how does the method compare to other methods? Um, uh, it's 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 fairly similar. It will it will tend to be um, the 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 friction angle that you might need to select might be a, a bit different than the the some of the more uh, uh, traditional ones. So I. I think um, the the older methods may be more conservative in, in some in some respects. Um, that's because some of the older methods they are based on or they're validated against um, model tests in a laboratory, where it's very difficult to define exactly what the friction angle is. So they selected a friction angle based on some other testing. But when you're doing a model test at one g at very low stresses. The friction angle may be quite different to what um, what you think it is, but the the t value method is derived from numerical studies um, where the, the friction angle is very well defined. It's a constant value within those analyses. Now I know that doesn't necessarily mean that that's representing reality, but it does mean that a more fundamental level you have a constant friction angle. Um, so that's why it may give results that differ a little bit from the existing methods. But my argument there is that it's, it's more about the assumptions regarding the friction angle. So you saw, you saw how the friction angle changes with strain level. It goes up to a peak and then it goes down to a lower value. Which value do you use in design? 
So maybe the traditional methods have assumed one value and um, the T value assumes well, the value that is most appropriate is the value that occurs at the full mobilization of the failure mechanism. So that may be um, less than the peak value. So in our, in our own design software, we take a, a lower value. Uh, so we take a post peak value and that will give similar results to the traditional methods with a peak value. So, that's, so that's, that, that's why we're more cautious about using a peak value because we know that um, if you put a peak value into our method, you'll, you'll get a, a thinner platform. Gotcha. And that, that's a perfect segue into my last question. And we'll, I'll stop asking questions after this. And that's the, that, that discussion about the uh, friction angle was, was, was great. Um, so when you're doing, I'm assuming you're going to recommend a track. So test we perform. Is there any other type of, um, like a type of triaxial test or confining pressure recommendations that you, you have when someone is saying, I need, I have a certain aggregate, I need it to, to test it for, for this design. Like what do you recommend there for triaxial testing? Well, it needs to be large testing, maybe not necessarily as large as our rig, but ideally, the, the diameter of the, the, the triaxial cell should be at least about six times the, the largest particle size um, or about 10 times the average particle size, something like that. Uh, the confining stresses don't need to be that high. Um, even if you're under a really big rig, the, the confining stress is still relatively low. Um, uh, I've only got metric units to hand, I'm afraid, but we go up to about 80 kilopascals. Uh, because we have a vacuum pressure around ours, um, we can't go much higher than that. That's 80% that's of atmospheric pressure. So, But we find that from our own analyses, numerical analyses, that that is within the range of confining stresses that you will get even under a large rig. So it doesn't need to go to, to high confining stress. Um, I definitely prefer triaxial with the direct shear or shear box. You, you can get um, very high friction angles due to the effect of dilatancy and, and the confining the dilatancy in a triaxial. There isn't that confinement. So, <clears throat> so I know I said I'd stop, but like, if you don't, have, if you don't have access to a large triaxial, so what are your options? Your options are, if it's, um, if it's an aggregate that is unusual and has never been tested before, then um, testing is better. Or if that can't be done, maybe uh, some sort of site testing. So you can do the sort of large scale plate load test that we did, rather like a, a pile load test. But if you, some organizations may have tested the material. If you speak to us at Tensile, we have tested um, a wide range of materials. So we may have already tested it and, um, and, and could share the, the results uh, with you. Um, so there is that option too. Okay, thank you. So I will get to the questions. Um, the first one is, and, and you did, uh, show a couple references and um but the question is uh what are the references available for the t value method um there are if you look at the published uh, paper there are a list of references at the back of that paper for one um but is there any sort of do you guys have a, a link that has a couple i think you have papers linked to your on your website as well is there anything else you, you can think of um if you look me up on ResearchGate, it has my publications there. That's one route. Um, the two papers I showed are both on the, the ICE website. So if you go, that's the Institution of Civil Engineers in the UK. So if you go to their publishing house and then look up my name and bearing capacity, something like that, it will come up with the papers. Uh, they, they are all copyrighted by the, the journal publishers, so unfortunately we can't distribute them freely due to copyright restrictions. But they, uh, 
that's those are options where you could find them or just get in contact with um, someone from Tensor and they'll be able to help you out as well. Okay, hey, thanks. I, I was able to find, uh, I have several, I was able to find them pretty easily. Um, like I said, I, I recommend going to the um, the paper that is published at Foundation Drilling and the one in DFI coming up here in October because it does have a list of, of the references there. Mm -hmm. But um, next question is uh, with, with strength, Having a curved envelope, what confining pressure do you recommend to use with the T value method? You kind of already already mentioned that a little bit, but that was one of the questions. Uh, yeah, the range. When we do a triaxial test, um, we start at ten kilopascals, which is a, a very low stress, and we go up to about seventy-five, eighty, depending on what vacuum we can draw. And we do an intermediate confining stress as well. So um, that is about uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.75 times uh, absolute vacuum. And so that, that covers the range. It would have to be a really big, unusual rig for that not to be uh, enough. Do you, I, I have often given answers in terms of, of like the, the, look at the track pressure and given multiples of the track pressure or, or fractions of the track pressure. Is that kind of what that's based on? Um, it'd be difficult to do it that way because if you look at the pressure distribution underneath the track, it, it varies a lot Yeah. throughout the platform. If you, if you move laterally or you move vertically, the stresses just vary so much, but the, the confining stress is the, the minor principal stress. So it's not the vertical pressure underneath the track. That is the major principal stress. And that is the, the force that you're applying in the tracks, you'll axially, and that gets very high. But it's the radial pressure or the lateral pressure in the platform um, is much less than that. Um, the, the ratios idea is interesting. I, I haven't considered that. But what, what I do is I would, my background is in FEA. I'll just set up a quick FEA in 10 minutes and it'll just show me the, the stress distribution so I get an idea. And the minor principal stress is pretty low once you get a little bit away from the, the, the base of the track. That answer was really helpful for me. I knew I should have taken that track shield class in grad school. Um, <laughs> but the next question is, can you run the method with an undrained strength ratio for the subgrade material. I don't, I'm not following that question 100%, but can you run the T method, I presume, with the undrained strength ratio for the subgrade material? Um, I don't know. Maybe I'll ask the next question and see if that question can be clarified. Um, and the next question is Have the T values been developed for stiff clay? over soft clay as well? Uh, not yet, but watch this space. We're working on it. Okay. Stay tuned for that. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. So just, just to finish the answer to that, then what we would do currently in that situation is you would just need to select an appropriate average value. At the moment, the T value is for a homogeneous subgrade either with a, an undrained shear strength or a phi. If you had layers, you could um, use your engineering judgment to select an appropriate um, average value, maybe work out what the influence depths are, the shapes of the failure planes, and come up with a, a conservative estimate of an average value. Okay. So it looks like the clarification just came for the one question. It says, for the subway material, can you use an undrained shear strength ratio instead of a constant undrained shear strength? That is, undrained shear strength increases with depth. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Then that's similar to the previous question. Um, you, no, you, you can't at the moment. You would need to select, just like in ordinary foundation design, uh, you would, there are rules of thumb, uh, take the average value at two thirds times B, just, um, 
Uh, I'm risking showing my ignorance here, but I think that's uh, that's somewhere in the memory bank. So that's a rule of thumb about what is the the the, the appropriate value to take. So in the case of a platform, you would look at the typical load distribution and, and, and loaded width at the base of the platform. And then based on that, what you think the influence depth is into the subgrade and, and take a, an appropriate average um, due to variation of strength with depth. Okay, great. Um, so that's it for the questions. Uh, that there is a question kind of came up, and this may be more for the DFI uh, staff, which is: is this will this recording be available later to at, to watch? I don't personally know the answer to that, but I think it will because it is we're being recorded. Um, I think the answer to that is yes, which is good. Uh, a couple other fo follow ups, um, um, and one is the PDH certificates will be available for the um, after the paid registrants. You gotta complete the webinar evaluation through the event module. Um, if you have trouble finding that, uh, re reach out. Um, in, in, as you did it with this and future webinars, uh, uh, get on the DFI website to register. Um, and please give us your feedback and su um, su suggestions for this uh, webinar, but also uh, any upcoming or webinars you're, you're interested in. And um, direct any questions to Tech activities at dfi.org. And with that, I think we are done. Thanks for your attendance. Thanks for your questions. Andrew, thanks for your time um, with, with all the information and preparing the presentation. My pleasure. Thanks everyone for attending and thanks Scott for organizing. Yes, no problem. Well, that's it. Take care. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.